One of the fun things about being old, uh, in fact, there's actually a lot of fun things about being old, but, but one of the things is looking back. I, I, in, the, in the first service, a, a young woman came up that I hadn't seen for, oh my goodness, maybe 10 years, and she's sharing what God is doing in her life, and it was so encouraging to me. Uh, she just lifted my spirits to see how she's walking with Jesus and their, their uh, family is making a difference in the lives of people around them. And I just, you know, here I am going between the services. I've got two sermons to preach. And, and I, just, I just said, thank you, Lord. Thank you for that person who decided to share with me what God is doing in her life and encourage my life. And as I, I look back over my life, the things that I don't remember... Uh, I don't remember how many games the Rams won. I, you know, even though, uh, I'm going to tell you a story. We actually had, see, my dad had season tickets to the Rams for 20 years. And so every Sunday we'd pack a lunch and sneak out at the prayer time so we didn't have to say hi to anybody. And <laughs> we'd, we'd zoom to the L.A. Coliseum we had the same guy who let us park on his lawn for 20 years. He became one of our best friends. And we'd go to the game. But when I became a youth pastor, I had this battle once a month um, during the football season. I had committed to take my youth group to a retirement home. And this is not just a retirement home. This is a retirement home where people go after a retirement home. So the average age of these people are mid-90s. Uh, and I got to tell you, it, they were all Christians. They're, they're amazing people. But I had this battle because selfishly, I wanted to go to the Rams game. I didn't want to hang around a bunch of old people. That was not my desire. I loved them, but for that day, that was not my desire. And, and I would have this inner struggle every time. And I got to tell you something. What God showed me through those times is that what you do in this retirement time, retirement home, is way more important than going to the Rams game. And at the end of the time, I, I always had dual feelings. A, I was so ashamed that I didn't want to do that. I was so ashamed that I'm such a selfish person that I really preferred to please myself than to do something for other people. And number two, it was a feeling of gratefulness to God. Thank you, God, for overcoming my selfishness. And... and you know how God kind of nudges you to where he sort of gives you no choice after a while. You, okay, we're doing this. And the fact that I was a youth pastor and, and I had to do it with my kids. So that, that helped me a lot. But I look back on that and these people had been through so much in their lives. Uh, this is one woman, I, I, I'll never forget her as long as I live and I'm looking forward to seeing her in heaven. But she had lost two children um, and her husband had died. She married again. Her other husband had died. I mean, she, her whole life was filled with loss. And yet she had the joy of the Lord written all over her face. And I always, I always left and I said, Lord, I want to be like that woman. I want to be like that woman who finds her joy not in circumstances and getting to do what you want to do but getting to love other people that's what today's message is about it's about ending the reign of selfishness in your life and I'm not saying your selfishness is reigning in your life but if it is I'm, I'm encouraging you today to see that true joy does not come from how people treat you. It does not come from how the circumstances hit you. True joy in life comes from pouring your life into other people. 
That's the essence of today. What I want to share with you a little bit is that we are in a difficult season as a world. It feels like, I don't know if you feel that, but it feels to me like the wheels of the wagon of this world are falling off. And what that says to me is that we need to be more intentional and more thoughtful about moving against the current of this world so that we can do what God wants us to do. Ephesians 5, 15 through 16 says this, Therefore be careful how you walk, not as wise men, unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time because the days are evil. Now, here's the point. The world wants you scattered, it wants you distracted, and it wants you entertained. Because as long as you're entertained, you are a passive participant in the culture of the world. Here's what God, how God wants you to live. I just kind of rephrased that verse in my own words. Be thoughtful and intentional as you live. This is every day. This is not when you get around to it. This is not when things are going well. This is not when you get things together. This is every day. Be thoughtful and intentional as you live. Don't live like a fool just blundering your way through life. But live as a wise person, spending your time on what's important and taking advantage of every opportunity God gives you because we have so little time left. Guys, the truth of God's word is Jesus is coming again. And I want to invest the time I left, have left before I die or before Jesus comes again, whichever comes first. I want to spend my time loving people and pouring my life into them. That's what Paul did. Paul poured his life into people and they caught the message and they started pouring their life into other people who started pouring their life into other people which is why you and I are Christians today. Because through 2,000 years of generations of Christians people decided that what God wanted them to do in the lives of other people was more important than what they wanted to do. And now, guess what? The previous generation has passed the baton. It's in our hands now. And the question is, what are we going to do with the life and the time that God has given us? So there are two simple desires that God has for you. And I, I want to kind of simplify life so you can develop a focus that you would maintain every day. Number one, God wants to change you to help you become like Jesus. Romans 8, 29 and 30. You all know Romans 8, 28, that all things work together for good. I used to, thought, I used to think that that would uh, mean that when I asked a girl out, she would go out with me. That's what all things working together for good meant to me. But that's not exactly what God has in mind when he said that. Here's verse 29. He defines good. For those whom he foreknew, that's us if you're a follower of Jesus, he predestined us to become conformed to the image of his son. I, this is so exciting to me. The moment you became a Christian, God declared you righteous. That's what justify means. That's what forgiveness implies. He, he actually said, Steve Larson, you are fully righteous. You are as righteous as my son Jesus is. So I'm down here. And now the journey God wants me on is the journey of becoming who I am. Becoming more and more like Jesus so that my love is more like his love. My priorities are more like his priorities. My values are more like his values. So that's number one. That's God's passion for my life. It's his will for my life is to become like Jesus. Number two, God's passion for me. And I just lost my... There we are. Number two, God's desire is for you and I to be Jesus to those that he brings into our lives. How important is this to God? There are 59 distinct commands in the New Testament, all with the words one another in them. 59 commands. So he says, comfort one another, encourage one another. Don't lie to one another. 
uh, don't judge one another, build up one another. All of these commands are what God says to us, how you treat one another is really important to me. There's one other thing I want to share with you, and that's Ephesians 4.30. Uh, Ephesians 4.30 is an odd verse because it comes right in the middle of this amazing re- relationship passage. Ephesians 4.25-32 through 32 is a passage on how we should treat each other. So it says don't lie to each other, speak truth with each other, don't be angry unnecessarily, all of these things. And then right in the middle of this passage, he says, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. And I'm going, huh? This doesn't fit in this passage. But it does. Because God is saying, God the Holy Spirit is saying, how you treat each other, how you speak to each other, how you respond to each other, how you choose to pour your life into each other is really important to me. And when you live selfishly, the Holy Spirit is grieved. So what we want to focus on today is really the question, are you about self-fulfillment? Are you about pleasing yourself, entertaining yourself, using your time as you see fit? This is the American dream. If so, I just want to, in love, share with you, I think you're on a losing path. Because the path of blessing is a path where we let God pour his love into us and then we, in turn, open our lives to pour our lives into other people and to pour the love of Jesus into other people. So that's where we're going. So let's uh, jump down now. Uh, I'm going to give you three principles for how to live this way. Principle number one. Learn to observe people. Learn to observe people and respond according to what you observe. Here's what 1 Thessalonians 5.14 says, and it, the, the words are simple, but the, the principle is so profound. We urge you, brethren, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, and be patient with everyone. Now, that sounds really simple, doesn't it? But there's something interesting about there. There's three different categories of people. There's unruly people, there's faint-hearted people, and there's uh, weak people. And Paul says, treat each one of them differently according to what's going on in their life. I think it was Maslow who said that he who is good with a hammer views everything as a nail. <laughs> All right, there, there are some people who read this passage and, he sa- and they interpret it, Paul saying, and we encourage you, brethren, uh, rebuke the uh, unruly, rebuke the faint-hearted, and rebuke the weak. In fact, go ahead and rebuke everyone. And, and so they're, they're, they're a truther. They're, hey, truth matters. We need to really have people living according to the truth. And if they're not living according to the truth, it doesn't matter why. They need a good rebuking. And there are others of us who are really nice. And so we think, ah, oh, be patient with the unruly. Be nice to them. Paul says, no, that's not what they need. Here's what I want you to begin to do. And this is, when I say observe people, I want to give you a couple of ideas on what that means. Observing people means looking at things like their their stature, their body language, their facial expressions, the tone of voice that they're speaking to you with. In other words, you're, you're actually listening for what's going on in their life, not just for the words they're saying. People who study communication say that less than 48% of how we communicate is verbal. Everything else is nonverbal communication. And if you want to become a wise investor in people, it's very important for you to slow down, not be so interested in talking, but be more interested in listening and observing. You can find out so much from people and God can open up ministry. Let, let me just give you an example. Let's say you're in a, uh, a community group and somebody who is normally 
fairly gregarious and they're outgoing and they're having a great time. They're really quiet that night. Most of us, I think, would go home and say, wow, they were really quiet. Some of us might think, hmm, I wonder what's going on in their life. And just a simple question, I, I, I noticed you were quiet tonight. Is anything going on? What that says is I care. And it opens up a window that that person can share, or maybe they won't, but at least they know that you were interested in hearing what they have to say, what's going on in their life. So unruly people are people who live outside of rules. That's what unruly means. They're, they're, uh, a lot of you are thinking of your kids right now. Um, they're, they're hard to control. They're hard to uh, speak with and, and make sense to. And basically, unruly people are people who just don't think the rules apply to them. And they live that way. Paul says we need to admonish them. What does admonish mean? I love this. Admonish means to warn with love. Uh, Little principle of admonishing. It never works when you're angry. Which is when we do most of our admonishing, I think. Admonishing is helping people to see if you continue on this trajectory of your life, this is where you're going to end up. So it's not really stop doing that, you're, you're messing up, you're goofing up, you're a terrible person. It's, hey, here's what I'm seeing in your life. And if you keep going in this direction, I think this is where you're going to wind up. And it's, it's a loving action. It's not an angry action. It's not because they're ticking you off or they're bugging you or they're doing things that you want to you get back at them. It's because you love them and you want to help to see them turn their lives before it's too late. So then there's faint-hearted people. Paul says the faint-hearted we should encourage. What is a faint-hearted person? It's a person who struggles with timidity, fear, anxiety, and those things tend to keep them from doing what God wants them to do. Now, if you want an example of a faint-hearted person, think of Joshua and write down in your notes Joshua 1, 1 through 11. Because God actually comes to Joshua and he says, hey, Moses is dead. You're it. Uh, You're going to lead this two million people uh, army that uh, Moses couldn't do anything with and you're going to take them into the promised land and you're going to do everything I command you to do. And I don't know about you, but I I look into Joshua's heart right there And I think a terrified man who is just saying, ABM, anyone but me, Lord. And God says, no, you're it. And time and time again, God says to Joshua, be strong and courageous, for I'm with you. What is God doing? He's encouraging Joshua. Now, what's the big word in encourage? Courage. Courage, exactly. This was not brain surgery. Okay, so... What you are doing when you encourage somebody is you are giving them courage. And I want to encourage you, I want to encourage, I want to uh, challenge you that when you give people encouragement, don't give them the world's encouragement. Everything's going to be okay. Uh, oh, you're going to ace this test, I know it. We, we, we make these predictions of people that have no foundation in reality, and we're just trying to say something to make them feel better and feel a little more encouraged. And to me, what I like to know is that God is going to be with me, whatever happens. In other words, I can't tell. In fact, it would have been terrible if somebody would have told me, oh, you're going to do well on that test, because I never did. So it, it, that kind of encouragement didn't help me. But what helped me is that God is never going to leave you or forsake you, and he's going to be with you as you flunk this test because you didn't study for it. (laughs) Here's what I'm saying. So many times we say things that if you take a step back, they're really foolish. And we're doing it out of a good heart. We're trying to encourage them. We're trying to help them. I want to let you know the greatest encouragement is the encouragement from God's word because God's word is true. And God's word will never fail. 
So Paul goes down, and I want to take you down now to, uh, oh, also help the weak. I'm glad we, I didn't skip that one. The weak are people who are overwhelmed with life. And a lot of times they're very frustrating to be around because they're in a hole, and what are they doing? They're digging. You know the old principle, if you're, if you're in a hole, the first thing to do is to stop digging. And they're, they're just continuing to dig themselves in this hole deeper and deeper. And a lot of times they will resist your help. And it's because they're overwhelmed. They, they can't think straight. Paul says something amazing. He says in Galatians 6, 2, bear one another's burdens. In other words, if somebody is weighed down by the burden, hey, just get under that with them and help carry it with them. Now, I've got to be honest with you. My wife is a million times better at that than I am. Uh, I was not given the spiritual gift of patience. I, actually, maybe it's not a spiritual gift. Maybe it's a, a quality of spirituality, which says something bad about me. But I, I struggle I'm glad to tell people what to do, but the idea of me getting under with them and helping them is really a hard thing for me because I tend to be selfish. And so that's something that I've been working with God on. God, I want to become a kind of person who is not so busy that I can't get with people and help them walk through a difficult time. You guys, this is love in action. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. So the, the principle of 14 is look at people and say, who am I dealing with? Am I dealing with somebody who is going into sin? Am I dealing with somebody who is uh, losing heart for the journey of Christ? Am I dealing with somebody who is uh, afraid and swallowed up with anxiety? We can rebuke them all we want, but that's not what they need. So you start not with what you know and what you like to talk about. You start with them and then you come back and you ask the Lord and the Holy Spirit for wisdom how can I help them Lord one of the things we're going to talk about is the fact that you can make a huge difference in people's lives and I think most of you don't quite believe that yet that's honestly one of the things that keeps us from getting into people's lives is where, what am I going to say what if, I, what if they say something and I don't know what to say to them that's where you trust and dive in. Trust and dive in. All right. So the other scripture I want to share with you from 1 Thessalonians 5 is 5.11, where Paul says, encourage one another and build up one another. Now, that's one that he didn't have in verse 14. Build up is really cool because it takes encourage a step further. Encourage is where you're giving people the courage to do what God wants them to do. Build up is when you're helping people discover the resources that they have to be able to do what they want to do. A lot of times we'll say, oh, don't worry about it. You can do it. And they're thinking, no, I can't. And so building them up is strengthening them, giving them the, the ability and the equipment and the scripture and the truth and even maybe the physical and financial resources to be able to do what God wants them to do. So it's a really active, selfless action of saying, you know what, you really can't do this right now. I'm going to help you, and you don't say those words, but you're saying, I'm going to help you get the equipment you need to do what the next step is in your life for. So principle number one is really become an observer of people. Principle number two is know your gift the gift that God's given you, and use it to stir others. Uh, let's go to 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 10 and 11. Uh, Peter says this, As each of you have received a special gift, put it to use in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. A couple of things that are so powerful in this verse. A, if you're a follower of Jesus, each one of you has received a gift from God. Each one of you 
have been wired by God and gifted by God for you to move into another person's life and serve them and help them with the need that they're facing. The second thing is as you do that, you're doing it as a steward of God's amazing grace. So what's happening, I want you to see this. You are actually becoming an instrument of God's grace in someone else when you serve them with the gift you've been given. That is amazing. What happens when this church gets locked into this is the grace of God just starts growing all through the church because we're seeing it in everybody's life because we're being stewards of His grace and we're investing in other people. Now, verse 11 is even more exciting. Because Peter simplifies spiritual gifts so much, he breaks it down into two categories. He says, whoever speaks, speak as if it were the utterances of God. In other words, use God's word as your authority when you speak. Whoever serves, do so with the strength God gives you. All right, so two categories of gifts. What are they? Speaking. And serving, exactly. This makes things so simple. I want to ask you, we're going to show of hands here. How many think your primary gift is a speaking gift? Raise your hands. Nice and high. Don't be ashamed. Okay, a few of you, okay. How many of you think your primary gift is more of a serving gift? Okay, most of you. That's the way it typically works. What's so neat is when you think in terms of speaking and serving, you can kind of figure out, oh, I'm in this category or this category. So if you're a speaker, the important thing is for you to saturate yourself, yeah, saturate, saturate yourself in the Word of God so that what you're speaking to people is the wisdom of God. If you're a servant, your priority is to get so in touch with the power of Jesus in your life. And that comes via the Holy Spirit. So that when you serve, you're doing it selflessly, you're doing it for the glory of God, and you're doing it with an unending source of power. So people who are running the sound system, people who are uh, running off things uh, that we have for our little cards, People are putting things on the website. All of these are serving gifts. And without these gifts being exercised, our church is crippled. When I was a youth pastor, I I had a few kids who were light years above everybody else, just in terms of their maturity. And they always would come 15 minutes early. And they would always say, can we help? And it was so unique. Their very presence encouraged me. But there were three kids uh, who were like this, and they were all artists. Uh, they were studying art in college, and, and they just had more talent in their thumbs than I had in my whole body. And so what we did, we were studying the book of Genesis, and we pulled out, I bought a big roll of butcher paper, and I said, would you guys tape this up? And as we go through Genesis draw a mural of the people and actions of Genesis. So as we were going through the book of Genesis, this mural was being done in real time. And by the end we were finished, we had this amazing pictograph of Genesis. And it was something that the kids in this youth group never forgot. I mean, I I talked to them 50 years later, and they still remember that study of Genesis, not because of my teaching, but because of the work of these three artists who were doing it. Now, they had to spend hours on this. And they could have spent hours doing something else, but they decided to put their gifts to use as a steward of the grace of God. And they did it with the strength that God supplies, so they had joy while they were doing this. And that's that's the key. When you're serving, serving with the power of God, you will have joy as you serve. All right? So that's number two. Number one is we want to become observers of people. Number two, we want to discover our gift and put it to use in serving other people. And number three, this is, in my view, where the rubber meets the road. Actively and intentionally 
be involved in the lives of other people, provoking them to love and good deeds. All right, now I'm going to say that. Actively and intentionally be involved in the lives of other people, provoking or stirring them to love and good deeds. I want to unpack this phrase by phrase. Uh, the, in verse 25 or 24, he says, let us consider how to stir one another to love and good deeds. All right. The first thing he says is, let us consider. And please write this down. Peter is saying, or not Peter, whoever wrote Hebrews, is saying that stirring people to love and good deeds is not natural. It's not intuitive. We have to think about the best way to do it. And so you start, again, you start, start observing people and you say, how can I stir that person to take the next step that Jesus wants them to take in their life? Or how can I help that person who has been wounded and is refusing to forgive, how can I stir them to love? How can I stir them, first of all, to receive the love and forgiveness of Jesus? And how can I stir them to open their lives to pour out the love and forgiveness to that other person? Ah, got to take you, sorry. Hebrews chapter 12, um, and we're going to look at verse 15. Now, you've heard me refer to this a lot. Um, 12.15 says, See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God, and that a root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it, by it many become defiled. The first three words of that verse are the most important to me. Those first three words are not written to the person who's struggling with bitterness. That's written to the people around the per person who is struggling with bitterness. And so, so uh, the writer says to me, Steve, see to it that Connie does not fail to obtain the grace of God. That she, see to it that she doesn't fall short of the grace of God. Well, why is it my responsibility? She should take care of herself. No, it's your responsibility because I'm telling you to take care responsibility for her and the same in our community group the same in our friendships the same in our fellow students at class the same in every relationship we have we have to see to it and guard each other so that we don't fall short of God's grace because in every difficult situation of life God gives you the grace to overcome it and to live godly in that situation and the reason some people get it and some people don't is some people say, no, God, I don't want your grace. I'm going to refuse to accept it. That's to fail to obtain the grace of God. Other people say, God, pour it on because I can't do this. I am really struggling with anger and bitterness, and I need you. And they, they open their arms to God, and the grace of God pours in, and they are they're washed from the anger and bitterness. And the writer says, this is hard. So those of you who are around this person, you see to it that they don't fail to obtain God's grace. Again, it's much easier just to say, well, I'll pray for them. And I, I'm not di diminishing prayer. What I'm saying is a lot of times we use, I'll pray for them as a cop-out, don't we? So if you're really going to pray for them, pray for them, but then use that prayer as a basis to take the next step. All right, so let us consider, A, it's not intuitive. We have to think about the best way to do it. B, how to stir. The word provoke or stir is kind of an a active word. Uh, the most, time it's used most in the Greek language is it's talking about provoking people to anger. Uh, you know how your kids do that sometimes? Or your husband or your wife, they just... Uh, when I'm doing counseling, I'll have one or the other say, you know, she knows where every button I have is, and she presses them continually. You know, that's sort of provoking in the wrong way. The writer is saying, I want you to provoke people to love. It's a very active 
almost kind of aggressive word. But I found the best way to provoke people is by asking questions to get them think, thinking. You can tell people the answer, but how much better it is to ask them a question that lets them think through and come to the answer on their own. So he says, let us consider how to provoke, how, how to stir, how can I stir you to love people more? How can I stir you to good deeds? The love is pretty obvious. The good deeds is, honestly, that, that term never resonated with me. Uh, and if you're Boy Scout, forgive me. I always thought of Boy Scouts, you know, helping a lady across the street, you know. And it, okay, that's good. But it didn't seem to have the gravitas that, that this writer really wants it to have. So to get that, let's go to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. Paul writes this. We are his workmanship. Workmanship it means a work of art. It means a masterpiece. In other words, Jesus is forming you into his masterpiece. Now, this is beautiful. You will, when you're formed, you will have the character of Jesus, but your personality. You'll still be you, but you with the character and love and passion of Jesus Christ. So that's what God is making you into. You're created in Christ Jesus. We are created for good works. So good works isn't just do a good deed every day. Good works is doing the things that you've been wired by God to do to build up others in the kingdom of God. How important are these good works? God actually prepared your path of good works before you were even born. So every day, God has good works that he wants you to do and that he's equipped you to do. And by the way, folks, these good works always involve loving other people. Always involve pouring into their lives. So why don't we do good works? Let me give you three reasons. Number one, we're too busy, tired, distracted, or self-focused. <laughs> That's all number one. We're too busy, we're too tired, we're too distracted, or we're too self-focused. In other words, my, the river of my life is so full, I don't have room for good works. Great illustration. No matter how full a river is, if you throw a rock in the middle of the river the river finds a way to run around it. And my point is, if, if you commit yourself to a person, the beauty is that God is going to make sure the rest of your life gets done. And if we're all involved in committing ourselves to a person, you don't have a hundred people that you have to commit to. You, you can focus on one or two to pour into their lives. Let's say everybody is doing this. People's needs are being met. They're being loved. They're being challenged. They're growing. And this church is exploding because the number one sign that the Holy Spirit is in charge of a church is that people love each other. Not with a hug love. Oh. I loved a lot of people today. I give a lot of hugs. Isn't that sweet? No, it's practical love where your life is being impacted because you are choosing not to do things you want to do, but you're choosing to do things that that person needs you to do. And when that happens, the church of Jesus Christ explodes in a good way. There was a, a leader in the, in the Roman Seminate who was sent by Caesar, Caesar to do an investigation of Christians. And he came back, and, you know, they had these horrible rumors, like they were, they were cannibals because they were celebrating communion, eating the flesh and blood of Christ, so people were accusing them of cannibalism and all of these crazy things. And this guy came back, and he reported to Caesar, and there was only one thing he could say. They love each other. 
That just, that's what screamed at him. That's the only thing he could come to to explain why the church was exploding and growing so fast. They love each other. Funny, Jesus said somewhat the same thing. He said, by this, all men that you will know, will know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. So gosh, what I'm praying is that you could open up your schedule and show others your love in your schedule. You could open up your checkbook and show others your love in your checkbook. You are showing love and probably two of the most precious resources we have, time and money. And when that starts becoming evident, there's a world out there that is, to quote a song, looking for love in all the wrong places. This is the right place to look for love. And it's actually, interestingly enough, the greatest evangelistic thing you can do to love other believers from the heart in a practical, visible way. Because when you do that, people will smell the love and they'll say, man, I, I want to be in on that. I want to be in on that. Paul was amazing. He was, he was an example of this. Philippians 2.17 he says, even if I'm being poured out as a drink offering, Paul is talking about his life being expended upon the sacrifice and offer, sacrificial offering of your faith. I am glad and I rejoice with you all. So Paul says, my life, whatever I have left, is, is actually being poured out. But it's being poured out to strengthen your faith. Paul says, that makes me happy. And what's cool is if you read the rest of uh, Philippians 2, Paul talks about several other guys who had the same attitude. They were, they were sick, but all they were concerned about was the Philippian church and, and loving them. And so their whole passion in life was not where their needs being met, was how can I meet the needs of other people? Now, here's the thing. This week, your life is going to be poured out. How do you want it poured out? How do you want it poured out? Are there people in your life right now that God wants to use you to touch and to strengthen and to build them up. You know, I, I look back over my life. And the greatest joy is that God used me to make a difference in the lives of other people. By the way, that's not because I'm a pastor. This whole discussion has nothing to do with vocation. This whole passion, this whole discussion has to do with what is the focus of your life going to be? Is it going to be serving and building up and strengthening and helping and encouraging and loving other people? Or is it going to be worried about what people are doing for you? If you want to be great in God's kingdom, learn to be the servant of all. And my dream for Anthem is that the love in this church is going to be so profound and visible and practical that people are hearing stories of Anthem love all over the place. And people are coming to Jesus because we love one another. Do we want the Holy Spirit? The greatest demonstration of the Holy Spirit 
It's the number one fruit of the Spirit, which is love. And love means I'm going to put what you need ahead of what I want. It isn't easy, but it's the best. We're going to invite the worship team to come up and and lead us in the last portion of our service. This is going to be a chance for us to celebrate communion. Again, I would encourage you, if if you're alone, it's so easy to just, oh, I don't want to ask somebody to go up with me, or or for some of you else to ask somebody to go up with you. Just let's make this a communal celebration, not an individual celebration. We have offering buckets, uh, and most of our giving is done online, but if you want to give here, uh, we have the buckets there. We're going to be singing praises to God. We're going to be putting ourselves on the altar before God and saying, Lord, I want you to use me. You guys, one of my prayers is that every one of you is thinking of people that God can use you to make a difference in their lives this week. Father, I just pray in Jesus' name that you would uh, get us excited about being your servants. Get us excited about loving other people with your love. Get us excited about being your instrument in this world. In Jesus' name, amen.